Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. The politics of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era are much different than what we have today. Today, we have an American presidency that commands the media attention, but back then, Congress, bosses, and activists held the limelight. Corruption and ballot box stuffing, as well as patronage, they might be synonymous with the era, but so too is the great hope of American democracy. Because for all of the election fraud, a larger percentage of Americans went to the polls than ever before, or ever after. They were freed from the shackles of slavery. African Americans had citizenship and thereby a share of the political power, even if it was short-lived. Political progressivism emerged as well, however we choose to define it. And that also sprang from the trauma of the Civil War and gave thrust to the women's suffrage movement, the calls for things like prohibition, the growth of settlement houses, and also the growth of child labor laws. Recent treatments of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era tend to emphasize this. Professor Heather Cox Richardson's call to rename the period Reconstruction and the Progressive Era is one example. One of the most exciting books about the era's political culture calls it the Age of Acrimony, a fitting description because any progress made by progressives came with as much bitterness as it did alacrity. Social change in the United States was hard fought, and it still is. Telling that story is rather complicated, and not least because the characters of that story are complicated people. Roscoe Conkling, the New York senator and leader of the Republican stalwarts that supported President Grant, epitomized the era's corruption and political spoil system. Conkling was really the worst kind of political boss, and yet, when we think of him as a civil rights leader, he was the most steadfast supporter of African-American civil rights. He never ceased to believe that the bedrock of democracy rested on crushing slave power. In this period, political parties also suffered from epic infighting. Among the Republican Party, there were factions like the Half-Breeds, the Stalwarts, the Greenbacks, the Mugwumps, and the Silver Republicans. All of these emerge in the Gilded Age. And the Democrats had their disagreements, too, between Bourbons and Populists and Southern white supremacists, better known as the Redeemers. Naturally, these factions represented policy positions. So things like tariffs, labor rights, citizenship, patronage, the very role of government in American life, all of this stood in the balance. To help us pick through the age of acrimony, I'm joined by Dr. John Grinspan, curator at the National Museum of American History and an expert on U.S. political culture. In addition to his most recent book, Dr. Grinspan has written The Virgin Vote, How Young Americans Made Democracy Social, Politics Personal, and Voting Popular in the 19th Century. And as you can imagine, these two books have so much to teach us about our current political situation. Thanks so much for joining us on the show, John. Yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. I wanted to start off by saying I thought it was beautifully written. I think you're a talented writer. Also, you you really have an eye for the gaps in the literature. We often call the years between the Civil War and World War I, uh, Reconstruction, the Gilded Age, and Progressive Era. But your book calls it The Age of Acrimony, and I wanted to find out why. Well, I needed a title. <laughs> um, it, in all honesty, I see this as one continuous era. I know, I know historians argue at length about where the borders between these, these eras are, and people talk about a longer progressive era, or what it means when Reconstruction really ends. Um, a lot of the same forces, especially when you're looking at electoral behavior, really look similar from the mid 60s through into the 20th century. That, um, you know, we, we see similar campaign appeals from kind of the wide awake marchers in 1860 on through how people ran a campaign in 1896 when it comes to running elections, winning votes, building a party, reaching out to people in, in saloons and, and throughout American society they have evolution over this period, but it seems to me one continuous era. And while there are significant changes and, and significant issues and big, big uh, lines in the sand at some points, I, I really think we're talking politically about one era. And, and um, so it felt natural to try to make the case that there's there's behavior. There's evolution with that era, of course, but th these lines we draw every three years in the Reconstruction, Gilded Age, Progressive Era, it just seems um, artificially dividing into micro eras. Yeah, that's a debate that's that's been going on. It's one that we've talked about on the podcast. And I think citizenship is so front and center in the Reconstruction period, or what's called Reconstruction, uh, that we sort of gravitate away from that a little bit in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And it's great to have that front and center again. 
I, I would add to that. I think there is a little bit of an attitude that things are currently, things are kind of urgent and immediate in reconstruction and the heat dies down in the Gilded Age. And, and that's, that's a, a bias we have, but I kept coming across sources from people saying, I didn't care about politics at all during reconstruction, but 1884 is the election I care about, or the, the money issue is the issue I care about in, in 1880. So the, the kind of the attitude we have that certain issues from the Civil War era are really significant and urgent to people and other issues, money, immigration, banks uh, are, are less immediate. It's, it wasn't borne out in the resources and, and, and in people's diaries and letters and newspapers. So I tried to follow, follow their campaigns and their, their values. Yeah, you have a great line in the book where you just say tariffs are boring, and you're right. I mean, people don't love talking about tariffs, but they did incite some real fevered conversations on Main Street as well as Wall Street. So, yeah, well, well put. And that's all the more amazing, isn't it? I mean, you can imagine why people are fighting each other over civil war and race and democracy, but people are cracking each other's heads over tariffs and the gold standard. And that takes, that takes even more skill from the campaigners to kind of heat people up that way, I think. Absolutely. And you you picked two great characters to tell that story of democracy at this really tumultuous time. Uh, your protagonists are Congressman William Pig Iron Kelly and his daughter, activist Florence Kelly or Flory. Um, what what made you pick these two to tell this this political story? Well, I wanted to tell this error and I wanted to make an argument about the change in democracy from the 19th century to the 20th century. And a lot of the really significant figures, <laughs> they dropped dead in 1898 or something like that, and they don't bridge the era. Uh, th that's one thing. I needed some through line, and they just connect to everybody. Going through their papers, you know, you see Abe Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Susan B. Anthony, W.B. Du Bois, Friedrich Engels, they just all show up. So they're, they're good in kind of the textbook approach of trying to tell a whole story. But also because they're, this family is so kind of intimately tied up with the political system and because they argue politics in their letters and in the, among their family and because democracy is so intimate and personal to them, it, I thought it was a good way to show how, how meaningful this, this democracy was to people. I think there's an attitude that Gilded Age politics is kind of mechanistic or, and not, not really significant to many people's lives. And you look at Will Kelly and Florence Kelly and it's, it's driving their, their daily behavior and also because their values were pretty similar across 100 years of politics from the 1830s to the 1930s, they were a really good way to test how democracy changed, how they tried to achieve their goals, because they're really fighting for rights, greater rights for working people, usually from the government, uh, so sometimes from kind of social organizations and lobbying and that kind of thing. But because they, they have a really similar goal across a century, you can see when running a campaign in the town square works and when lobbying behind the scenes works. And, and some of that is about gender and class and other things, but you can really use the, the Kelly family to, to test what works if you want to reform society. Yeah, they're great characters and they, they, they really show off the, the class aspects, but they also show off, as you say, a number of the various racial or gender dynamics that are going on. The racial dynamics in the book, I think, are really, you, you talk about really well, because abolition and the Civil War had this strange effect on American society. It settled this big political question that was there from the beginning of the formation of the Republic, but only to an extent. And you tell that story really nicely with Octavius Caddo, who is the principal of the Philadelphia Institute of Colored Youth. He gets murdered by an Irish immigrant, what, what effect do you think African-American citizenship and the ability for African-Americans to vote had on post-bellum political culture? Well, I mean, they're, they're kind of the, the question of practicality and the question of, of human liberty. I mean, he, here you have four million people who have denied all, all basic rights and suddenly roughly a million or more are able to vote in, in places that were, <laughs> their whole political society was designed against this population. So the fact that you have in 1868, Ulysses S. Grant is elected president for the Republican Party based on the votes of freed slaves, African-Americans in Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. Uh, that's really, it's just such a gut game changer. And it's such a, a test case for what happens when you you expand rights. Uh, at the same time, there's the, the kind of the hustle for new votes. And you can see this on the ground in Philadelphia. You can see this among Republicans who who've been talking a good game about, about human liberty and anti-slavery for years. And now they have to say, well, well, is it better to enfranchise a population and, and, and kind of hustle for their votes or, or to kind of keep things the way they are when we have an advantage. And then in a way, African-American voting rights, the way they rise and fall from the 1860s to the 1870s, 
parallel a changing course in broader American attitudes towards democracy writ, writ large. That I do think there are ups, uh, ups and downs, but there's an expanding sense of faith in popular voting, uh, voting rights to kind of improve society up through the 1860s, maybe peaking 1870 with the 15th Amendment. And by 1876 or so, with the, that disastrous election and the, the end of Reconstruction the next year, you really see this turning point towards across society, a greater hostility towards electoral politics and democracy as a, as a, a force of reform and, and a way to benefit human liberty. Uh, and their African-American voting rights are right there. That doesn't mean it's all about race. I mean, there are people who are voting on a myriad of issues who care about race, who don't care about race. But, but the timing is really significant that the peak in around 1870 just ties up with the expansion of voting rights. And then this contraction for the next 50 years begins around 1877. And and continues well into the 20th century with you know, the rise of Jim Crow happens along the same time. Um, so I guess the timing is too significant to, to not be, be a driving force there. Absolutely, and I think you tell that story well with folks like Roscoe Conkling, who we often just think about as this corrupt politician, but he also was the, the most fervent supporter of African-American voting rights. And uh, the other thing about your story is about the decline of voter participation from really from the 1860s to the 1910s. It's on a steady decline. And you make the case that this is possibly, but likely down to the secret ballot. Perhaps you could explain to the listeners why the secret ballot had this effect on voting. Yeah, absolutely. Can I speak to Conkling for a second first? Sure, of course, yeah. One of the beauties of this story to me is, and one of the beauties of guilt history in general and Gilded Age history especially, is there are no set good guys and bad guys. And people like Conkling who are, the greatest force of corruption and, and bossism and really undermining positive attitudes towards American democracy in the 1860s, 1870s, are also the, the firmest defenders of civil rights up, up until the, he's out of power. So it, the, the easy convergence of all the people we like on one side and all the people we don't like on the other side just doesn't work. And often the kind of the, the strongest defenders of a reconstruction are orthodox Republicans who, who feel like they have something to lose if they give up on it. Uh, and then people who we, I think, otherwise admire, like Will Kelly, we see him betraying Reconstruction, essentially, and uh, clean, washing his hands of it after 20 years of, you know, shedding blood on the battle lines of fighting for, for African-American civil rights. In 1875, he says, things are settled, we're done, basically. So I, I don't know, I, I just think that was a narrative way to explore the trade-offs of history and the, the, the fundamental flaws in, in all our people I, and kind of get away from too much idealism in our history. In terms of the secret ballot, I mean, I'd say that, that American democracy in the 19th century is uh, really communal in some ways. Obviously, many people are not allowed in that community, right? Many African-Americans, all women, anyone under 21 can't vote. But for the population that is voting at and turning out at 80% turnout rates in these massive elections, they're going to the town square to join in their society with their elders, with their family, with their opponents, to, to holler slogans and sing songs and cast their, cast their ballot in front of the eyes of their whole community. Take a ballot that's printed by a, a private party printer and put it in the box or the bowl or, or what have you under the watchful eyes of everyone they know in their community, the strangers in the city they live in, um, family members, opponents, challengers trying to keep them from voting. It's, it's fundamentally communal and social and that drives that massive participation. We, I did a book earlier on, on young people in politics and you can see these 21 year olds who are about to vote for the first time getting dressed up, you know, combing their beards and their hair and going out with their uncles to, to drink a beer and then go vote. And that's, that's an initiation for them. Uh, the secret ballot, voting behind a uh, uh, voting curtain, all of these things break up that communal engagement. And, and the reformers see that as a plus. They talk about the voter alone with his conscience in the booth, voting privately, consulting only some kind of inner, inner compass, not, not really engaged in these social questions, these tribal questions of who they're voting with and against, but really simply reflecting on the issues and voting. To us, I mean, that's how democracy should work, most of us, I think, would say in the 20th and 21st centuries. But to get there is a major change, and it, it really affects turnout. I mean, you see turnout crash precipitously from 1870, 18, 1887, 1890. They, they enact these laws in states, and you see turnout start to crash from 1896 on, especially in states that enact, that require voters to pick every candidate. They can't vote party anymore, straight party, the, the way you would with a, a printed ballot. You see turnout really crash, I think nearly about twice as much in those places. So there's a, there's a direct relation, and this is pretty well established between 
the mechanism of voting and how engaged in democracy people are. Yeah, absolutely. It just it does seem counterintuitive that a secret ballot would be the thing because it seems like that's protecting voters' rights and and freedoms and uh, and privacy, I guess. But uh, yeah, in the end, it it doesn't. Um, your book grapples with so many different ideas about democracy. Do you think it's possible to settle? And it might not be. And and feel free to say that we can't do this. But is it possible to settle on a definition of of democracy? Because you have this really lovely quote from E. B. White. Uh, on that in your book. And I just wondered what you thought about if we can settle on a common idea of democracy. No, <laughs> um, and, and we also can't settle on a common idea of what a good election should look like. I mean, we have nostalgia for the past. We're, we're all worried about the direction of our democracy today, but I don't think any historian could sit down and say, any, any period was the ideal peak. You know, 1972 was the perfect election. Well, probably not 1972. I, I don't think we could pick one, right? Like uh, th these are all moving targets and these are all terms that people use sloppily. Um, I I'm most interested in electoral politics and how electoral politics influence personal lives and, and social lives. That, that uh, democracy is a really large force of many different ramifications, especially into the 20th century where social democracy kind of widens things a little. Uh, in the 19th century, when people talk about politics, they mostly mean party politics and electoral politics. And that, that shows up in the household, it shows up in the saloon, in the bedroom, it shows up throughout society in the workplace, but it, it, it often revolves around one party versus another at the ballot box. And so when they, when they throw around the word democracy, that's, that's usually what most Americans mean at the time. Not all, there, there are lots of reformers, but um, the average guy voting or the average sister of a guy voting tends to mean electoral politics, this, this central competition in American life, the idea that, that, that somehow the best will be brought out by this competition. And what you see in the Gilded Age is if you supercharge that competition and turnout and partisanship, it can great draw the highest engagement in our history, you know, peak turnout, uh, closest elections we've ever had, and it can draw out some real ugliness too. So I, I was kind of writing the book really before the, the current era point us in this direction to toy with the, the dark side of democracy, even when it's working, quote unquote, properly. Yeah, and it does get pretty dark at times. I mean, when you're talking about those political parties, it's like one is worse than the other. And it's like a, a circling drain. And it was, was sort of the parties are going down the drain, quite literally, bringing out the worst in each other. Do you think that's a fair assessment? And how do you think we stop the race to the bottom? Today or, or in 1884? Well, I think, I think you know, the, the question is vague because it, it could relate to the, back then. I don't think we have a firm answer on how things get better then or now in, in American democracy. So I'm, I'm open to hear all your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it really, well, I'll definitely agree that it looks like a race to the bottom. And I guess from our perspective, looking back on Gilded Age, there's one political party, the Democratic Party, that is basically unconscionable, that is using mass political violence to suppress African-American voters, that is really, uh, especially in the, the you know, two decades after the Civil War, involved in terrorism. And, and so they are like, no, probably wouldn't vote for them. But you look at the other option and the Republican Party is running this boss machine using corruption, violence, uh, influence peddling, election stealing. They're, they're, they're no great heroes either. And they get, the further they get from the Civil War, the worse and worse they look. And in so there's a, yeah, there's no one I would vote for. You look at all the political parties, pro oh, the minor parties, pro probably not. How we improve democracy, I guess the only people, at least in, in the book I just wrote, who, who to me feel like they're pointing in the right direction are the muckrakers who are really digging into society while spending time with the people they are most hostile to. That people like Lincoln Steffens, you know, for generations, Americans, especially elite Americans had condemned party machines and bosses, and they did so from the ivory tower or from their pulpits or from gentlemen's clubs. And, and they really, they never understood how the political system worked. And, and they did so with such a elitist sneer that you could see they didn't really have a better option to offer mass society. People like Lincoln Steffens or Frederick Howe or Jane Addams, uh, they did so with this, or, or, you know, Florence Kelly, they did so with this incredible self-criticism of their own society and willingness to delve into the forces that were really driving people. You know, Lincoln Steffens spent more time with, with the bosses than he did with the reformers and seemed to like them a lot better. Uh, I don't know. Uh, they didn't create a perfect society either. They all had their massive flaws. Some supported eugenics. Some were, you know, fans of the Soviet Union. But uh, I think their, their method of digging in and spending time with those people you're most hostile to is probably the 
probably the best way to try to reform a society. But then again, I'm a historian, not a reformer. So I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a horrible track record for predicting the future or knowing what would be better. Well, I think we all do nowadays. Um, yes, but true. but that I, I have to ask you a little bit more about that part of the book. It's it's from 1890 to 1915. It's the the last part of your your book, and there's that emphasis on political communities. And I did think that for me that that was a, a great um, opportunity to showcase how political communities could really develop. All the people that you were talking about were were political elites. I mean, Florence Kelly is you know she comes from a politically elite family, but what she's doing is just like Jane Addams is that she's getting into that community. So why do you think that that happened at that time? And why do you think that the, those communities formed the way that they did? One of the things they're coming out of is they're coming out of a sense that the political system is deeply flawed and has to change. That I think the, the previous generation in Reconstruction and the Gilded Age, I think a lot of them have emancipation in the Civil War as a positive example in, in their rearview mirror and are looking for the next cause like abolition. They, they know that society can be rapidly improved with some government action. And so they're hunting around for socialism, voting reform, uh, you know, social Darwinism, what have you. They, a lot of people across society, especially you know, among the Northern majority and the Republican majority, they, they really believe there's a next emancipation waiting for them and they just need to find it. And that's why you get all these cranks in the 1880s of monomaniacs who believe their, their one cause will solve society. And, and yeah, some of, them, some of them end up making great inventions and some of them end up shooting presidents. Um, the reformers in the guild, yeah, I'm sorry, going into the progressive era, they grew up with the sense that politics is corrupt, that democracy does, is failing, that voting rights maybe don't always work, that the people in power are not, are not going to solve your problems. And, and I think that that, uh, that jaundice this and kind of uh, uh, cynicism from an early age made them actually capable of making real concrete reform on the ground, that they weren't hunting for giant millennial uh, like change to fix all of society. I don't know. I think that that ultimately made them a lot more successful. You can see that with Teddy Roosevelt, certainly. They, I, I know I shouldn't preach to you about Teddy Roosevelt, but like it'd be hard to pick one single guiding ideology or philosophy as much as, as uh, uh, like a flexibility and, and uh, um, improvisation. I think you see that in, in the metaphysical club a lot too on the pragmatists. This, this approach that I think comes from growing up in a society of deep cynicism and hostility. And, and maybe that'll be positive for the next generation. The you know Generation Z or whoever today are growing up in a time of cynicism. Maybe they'll be able to make concrete reforms that us idealistic millennials or Gen Xers or, or boomers were never able to achieve because we were so stiff in, in our thinking about reform. I think that puts the generational idea into really stark relief because you can even think about it from our time, like you're talking about boomers. And, you know, I'm sure that, you know, they, they can say, well, our great achievements are, you know, say second wave feminism or, you know, the development, you know, Dr. Spock, and we're not spanking our kids anymore. And look, there's all these achievements that we've had. You know, and Gen Z is looking on and saying, well, you've also destroyed the planet and now we've got to we've got to take care of that. So you can see that, I think, in the story of American democracy. I did wonder, however, in your research was did you come across anyone who just opted out? It just said, I, I can't pick anyone. I just want to stay out of American politics because it's all just such a mess. Yeah, I mean. Well, that's the first response. That's especially the response from wealthy people that in the years after the Civil War in, in cities like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, the attitude from kind of the upper middle classes is it's all broken. A gentleman never votes, they say. Bother politics, which is like screw politics, essentially. And that's the attitude for 15, 20 years among the people who are making money and running universities and building the institutions that, that kind of built Gilded Age society a lot of them steer clear of politics and a lot of them don't want to participate. And then you, to their eyes, not to my eyes, to their eyes, you get this system that's driven by these working class politicals who they don't like very much. This is how you get a political system run by Irish Americans or Jews or Italians or whatever. Now, that's not a problem to me, but that was a problem to them. And you get a, you get a movement in the 1890s, 1880s of, of young people re-engaging politics, people like Teddy Roosevelt and John J. Chapman and, and all these, these reformers who look at their, their parents who sat on the sidelines and said, you can't fix anything from just condemning everybody. And so uh, kind of the blanket condemnation of politics, everyone's corrupt, all politicians are bad, which I think you hear a lot again today is, it's never gonna be a force for reform. 
Yeah, I think that's um, that's that's a great that's a great point. I think your reference to Theodore Roosevelt being that kind of of that class is the same. Yeah, but I, I would also say there there's a second response. There's also kind of a father politics response in the 20th century from kind of the majority middle class, which is that they want a less demanding politics. That the the democracy of the 20 or the 19th century, which requires you to vote in person and march and drink and holler and fight and throw bricks at the Democrats when they're marching. It, it's pretty demanding. It's a lot of work to run those campaigns and, and it, it takes up a lot of society and um, it focuses a lot of social reform and culture on electoral politics. The democracy they build into the 20th century just asks a lot less. It's quieter, it's more private, it's more restrained, it's more independent. It, it, it doesn't take over the center of society the same way that a, a campaign in 1876 takes over so much of American popular culture. So that is a little bit like that turning down the volume that you're talking about. It's interesting though too, because we think about American politics at this time as being loud and rowdy and in some cases radical. And I was wondering if you thought that Marxism and socialism and was a was a strong enough challenge to those Republican and Democrat machines that are sort of cooling down politics amongst uh, their voters? Uh, to some degree, some people, yeah, like Florence Kelly, they, they just see all of the options in American electoral politics as so paltry compared to what the modern industrial society is up against that it seems insignificant. You know, Florence Kelly was a suffragist it was, and was connected to the other suffragists and knew them, but she saw them as kind of middle class kind of moving around the chess pieces on without changing the board. She she would she saw them as so partial and not engaging in the labor question and socioeconomic questions and income inequality that whether whether women had the right to vote or not was so secondary to her that it wasn't worth getting all that fired up about because there was the revolution to fight for. Um, it, things also work the other way too. You know, historians kicked around why was Marxism and socialism not more popular in America in the Gilded Age? And they look at wealth and they look at labor conditions and they look at unions and they look at all these things. But the one other aspect is that the political system was really appealing to working class people. So if you if you love the Democratic Party or you love the Republican Party and you feel that it's the one institution welcoming you in an otherwise hostile industrial society, the socialists don't look that all appealing compared. So I, I think I think for a long time we've neglected electoral politics when we talk about the Gilded Age and seen it as mechanistic and, and kind of distant from the people. And that's made it harder to answer some of these questions about how things like Marxism fits into society. That's such a great point because when when I was reading your book, that's the thing that I was thinking about is that it's hard work to be a socialist and a Marxist in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. It's not that hard to be a Democrat because you can just you know vote the, the party line and you know that they're looking after you if you've got those you know if you're if you're working in New York City and you're an Irish immigrant and you're working on the docks, you know that Tammany is going to support you. So that's why I thought it was so so much harder to be a Marxist or a radical. You had to go out and take action. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't have the institutions to defend you. You don't have a national network. That, so if you're a if you're a dock worker in New York and you decide to start over and move to Nebraska, the Democratic Party is still waiting for you in Nebraska with their saloons and their their bosses and their friends. And, and you can have an instant community nationally. I mean, no, you're not going to find many Democrats in Vermont or many Republicans in South Carolina, but there are these national networks that are designed to win over as many people as possible and to, to make make a lot of friends. That's that's how the political system works. That's why saloon keepers ran ran political parties and, and uh, campaigns, because they knew people in a community. There's not much else like that in Gilded Age society. That The institutions are so thin for so many working class people, and, and Marxism and socialism barely exist in, in, in most of America. I mean, the, there are few, but it's not it's not a dominant movement uh, the way it, you'd find it in cities in Germany at the same time. Uh, and they they say this. Frederick Engels and Florence Kelly talk about how they, can they grow grow Marxism in the English speaking world where they find it not uh, find people fairly hostile to it. But yeah, you're going to find party politics wherever you go, and that's really welcoming to people who are so disruptive and have so few other institutions. And that I think we we tend to neglect the significance of of that sense of community. And and I guess sorry. And I guess we also see that again today. One of the reasons I think partisanship is so intensified is the sense of disruption and isolation. So many people feel. No wonder, no wonder we have really heated politics again. And I think the other well, the, the for me the big takeaway from the book is that is that sense of community. And it's the that the politics of this age are highly personal. And you, you you say that really clearly in the book. And it comes across just about on every page, whether it's activists, bosses, voters, politicos. 
Historians, though, they have a tendency to depict American politics at this time as being the product of impersonal systems like industrialization, mass migration, urbanization. I wondered what, why? Why do you think that is? And is there a is there a good balance to strike between the personal agency and the, the, the sort of systematic agency? I think one of the reasons we see Gilded Age politics as so distant in particular is because of the supposed weakness of the presidents of the time that, you know, we we. We tend to tell our history in terms of 40, 46 guys, basically. And when you look back at the 1870s and 1880s and you look at the, the Rutherford Hayes and Ulysses S. Grants, to a lot of Americans, they can't be very compelling figures. And so the only other explanation has to be these big forces. It's, a, it's either 48, 46 guys or massive forces like industrialization. And uh, it certainly is massive forces. But um, there's a whole vibrant world under the presidential level. And presidents are kind of deliberately weak in the Gilded Age. People, political bosses and in individual states don't want some president who's gonna be stronger than the, the senator from the state of New York or whatever, or you know, Tammany Hall leader. Uh, so you have a lot of action underneath the presidential level, really dynamic, interesting people in Congress and in, in machines around the country running these things. Uh, campaigning, as, as I said earlier, was really labor intensive. So you see a lot more social impact in communities from people who would never actually run for office. Uh, I think we, we, tend to neglect, we tend to neglect the immediacy of the story and the personal aspects because we don't have a, a John F. Kennedy or a Ronald Reagan from, from the Gilded Age that people wanna kind of grab onto. I mean, you know, Grover Cleveland's a more interesting guy than people give him credit for. Ulysses S. Grant is a really interesting guy, but we're when you sum it up as these kind of six or seven gray bearded guys from Ohio, you you miss so much dynamism below the surface from from immigrant politicians, from people who are, are fighting for you know rights for freed slaves or for economic inequality against economic inequality. Like you have just a lot of interesting politics on the ground below the presidential level, and we've gotten stuck on this level that is not the most significant to people at the time. I think I think you couldn't be more right that Congress has so much more power and there's this burgeoning bureaucracy in this time period that is it's wound up with things that are happening outside of uh, of government in the in the business world like the efficiency movement I mean the whole the whole system seems to be changing and I, I couldn't agree more that we haven't given enough time and attention to that uh, I have another question though that is something that was the most well, for me one of the most intriguing things i read in the book and it's not it's not a big question it's not something that's you know existential about the eras democracy or politics so i read uh your take on mark twain and and charles dudley warner's terminology gilded age i always saw the metaphor as a somewhat disparaging one that describes the period uh as the gilding obscures something that's ugly, right? It's it, but what you say is no. This it's something else. Tell us about how you figured that out and and what what it means. Yeah, this is the one soapbox I want to get on because it like it blew my mind when I realized it. So when when Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner published The Gilded Age in 1872, they're quoting from Shakespeare's King John, in which he refers to someone who would gild refined gold itself. We, we, when we think of the Gilded Age, look back through a hundred years of kind of uh, jaundiced view of the Gilded Age, and especially the progressive era that came back after it, which is real negative attitude towards the Gilded Age. And we assume it means gilding on rot, right? You have a gilding that looks like gold and under it is, is something flawed and disgusting and the inequalities and the, the failures of the era. But if you're living in 1872, you're not looking back. It's not 1893. It's not 1896. You're not looking back at all the failures of that era. You're looking at the very beginning of this era when there are a lot of problems in society, but fortunes, immense fortunes are being built. People are, it seems like there's diamond encrusted everything. They're, they're making their new cocktails. I, you know, I listened to your show on, on cocktails. It's a really good capture, way to capture, this is gilding on gold. This feels like a society that is over the top and gaudy and showy in a way that you know, rural, agricultural, Yankee society didn't look before the Civil War, that, that um, they feel like they're living in a bold new era and they're not really being cynical about it. I mean, yeah, Mark Twain is very cynical about it, but when they say Gilded Age, they mean gilding gold. They mean the over-the-topness of the era, not the falseness of the era. At least that's, that's how I read it in the Shakespeare quote. It's totally different than, than how it's usually interpreted. I mean, this changes everything. You realize that. I mean, no, no one else is talking about this. Um, okay, so good. Well, I'm... <laughs> I'll have to, I'll have to look it up because I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point that 
you know, listeners of the show are going to be interested to hear about, you know, this. I didn't, I didn't know about it. And I've, I've read the book a long time ago now, but um, yeah, it's something that we, I just associate it with corruption and, and actually not business, but corruption. So. Yeah. And I think it's because we live post-progressive era. I know a long time post-progressive era, but in so many ways, a progressive era is designed as an answer to the Gilded Age. And certainly it's politics are designed as an answer to the Gilded Age. And you read the, the memoirs from people written in you know 1910, they all start with how bad things were in 1880 and how they improved them over their lifetime. So th there's just a narrative of anyone thinking about the Gilded Age for a long time afterwards of a, a need to correct. And so of course it's gilding, it's gilding rod, it's gilding shit. It's something, something negative in the core of society. But if you're living in 1872 when you're seeing railroads sprouting up and incredible empires being built and tycoons who have, you know, are festooned in diamonds and jewels and inventing all their new drinks and everything and eating new feasts. If you look at the behavior of the Astors or whoever, it looks like gilding gold. It's, it's wealth on top of wealth is, is how it seems to a lot of people. And you know what? Even to working class people, I mean, it's not a great age in many ways. It's growing income inequality, but there's also growing pay and there, there is building wealth in, in a lot of ways for even ordinary people in America. So, you know, it's not in some ways it's, it's distant from attitude, but it's not too far from one vision of life in the 1870s. I love it. It's the excess, the excess of the age, the Baroque era, they might, they might as well call it. Um, uh, it's also, it's 1872. It's not 1873. Yeah. Like they're right on the verge of another horrible depression, but you know, it's like, it's like if it were written in 2006 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. No, it's brilliant. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question uh, because you work on contemporary politics on the, the objects and the material culture of contemporary politics. Um, I wonder. I wanted to know if you could find any connections. I mean, we often talk about a second Gilded Age, and whether it's in opinion pages or or even in academic circles. What, what connections do you think we can make with between the politics of the Gilded Age and the politics of today, in material terms, and more generally speaking? Because of course, those materials relate to what's going on, you know, in the voting booths and, and around the country. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, the part of the origin of this book was living in two eras at the same time. On the one hand, researching the politics of the late 19th century, and the other going to conventions, primaries, protests, political events in the 21st century, and you know, watching things like the 2016 RNC with Donald Trump accepting the nomination. And it, it just felt like I was moving between two eras who could communicate with each other. And seeing things like you know, studying essentially torchlit marching campaigns from the 19th century, and then seeing 2017, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville where they're marching with tiki torches, it, it felt like people were stepping on and playing with and, and returning to behaviors that, that we'd, we'd put away 100 years ago. You know, not always for the same causes, but it felt like a, re a relapse in some ways or a return. And so th this book kind of grew out of trying to explain how these errors are connected and, and not necessarily because they're similar, but because the error in between was so unusual. And you know, you can see that in material terms when you go through the collection at the Smithsonian. The, the objects from the 19th century are torches and uniforms and ballots from stolen elections and, and you know, beer steins that say Republican or Democrat or Knights of Labor or whatever on them. The objects from the 20th century are buttons, parasols, and, and you know, uh, boaters and Panama hats. And they just seem more restrained than, than the engagement with politics from an earlier era and less personal. They don't, you know, you putting a button on your shirt makes a I think a smaller statement than wearing a campaign uniform and fighting someone in an opposing uniform. Uh, and then in the 21st century, we see just this return of homemade signs of, of all sorts of materials that, that we hadn't seen in a hundred years, costumes, that kind of thing during the election. It, so it really feels like in some ways we're seeing trends reemerge. And, and I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to make the case that that's because the air in between was so unusual. And, and often in democracy, people dress up in funny costumes and often in public life. That's that's something that goes back to folk cultures way before America. So I don't wanna you know, be uh, a Pollyanna about any of the really dangerous trends we're seeing in our society, but some of it is a reemergence of something natural, which is a, a kind of vibrant public life. That's the best, most optimistic spin I can put on what's, what's a pretty nasty era. No, I think that's very optimistic. And I think you give us a really good picture of what it was like back then and, and how in some ways we, we almost have a book ended 20th century or at least late 20th century. It's, it's a wonderful book. I just wanna encourage everyone to go out and, and pick up a copy because it's, it's, it's not only really a, a, a great picture of some of the most important characters of the Gilded Age, 
but it really shows how they had agency in a way that we don't talk enough about it. I mean, we do talk about big systems and processes that were going on in that time. And this book is just a great insight into how individuals and their efforts went a long way to, to shape American democracy. John, thanks so much for coming onto the show. Oh, thank you, Michael. It's been really fun. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.